At the end of our last session, we were talking about God brought Israel to existence for his glory. And we were noting that according to Deuteronomy chapter 28, the way God does that is through the twofold way that he deals with the nation of Israel historically. And we noticed that in, in Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14, that he told the people of Israel, if you will listen to and obey my word, my commandments I've given to you, I will bless you more than any other nation upon planet Earth. You'll always be the head nation, you'll never be the tail nation. But if you do not listen to and obey my commandments, my word I've given to you, I will curse and uh, vex and frustrate you just about more than any other nation upon planet Earth. You'll be scattered among the nations. There you'll have no a permanent place where you can stay. You're going to have to move from nation to nation to nation. And uh, you're going to despair for life itself. You won't know in the morning if you'll be alive that evening. If you are alive that evening, you'll know if you'll be alive the next morning. And tragically, that's been the history of many of the Jews for many, many centuries, from the Middle Ages on. We'll see some of that later on in our, in our conference uh, this, this particular session, not, a, not in this hour. Anyhow, remember again, glory is what is impressive or influential concerning a person or a thing. And so God was saying to the nation of Israel, the reason I'm going to deal with you in this twofold way is this, to impress the world with two great truths concerning myself. Number one, I'm the kind of God who will bless those people who will listen to and obey my word that I've given to them. And number two, I'm also the kind of God who will curse, vex, and frustrate people who will not listen to and obey my word that I've given to them. Given to them. Now, why would God do this in this twofold way? Why would he bless Israel? more than any other nation upon planet Earth. Well, he told us why in, in uh, verse 10, verse 10 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. He says, And all people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. He's saying, when I bless you more than any other nation, that's going to arouse the curiosity of other nations. And they're going to say, why is Israel being blessed more than we are? And they're going to investigate, and they're going to find out it's because of your relationship with me and that you listen to and obey my word that I've given to you. Why would he curse them so much when they would not listen to obey his word? Well, in verse 37 of Deuteronomy 28, this is what he said to them. You shall become an astonishment. The Hebrew literally says a horror, H-O-R-R-O-R, -R -O -R, a horror a proverb and a byword among all nations, where the Lord shall lead you. What he's saying is this. Israel, through this twofold way I deal with you historically, I'm going to impress the world with these two great truths concerning me. Again, I'm the kind of God who will bless those people who listen to and obey my word that I've given, but I'm also the kind of God who will curse, vex, and frustrate people who will not listen to and obey my word. Now, uniquely related to this, there's a reason, therefore, that God chose to put the nation where he did geographically upon planet Earth. In fact, in, uh, in uh, one of the Old Testament books, Leviticus, chapter 25 and verse 38, this is what he said to the people of Israel. I brought you out of Egypt, not just to be your God, but to give you this land, to give you this land. Why is it that he told Abraham, leave her the Chaldees and go to the land that I'll lead you to? It ends up being the land of Canaan. Why is it then he says to them, I brought you out of Egypt, not just to be your God, but to give you this land? He wanted that nation located in that place upon planet Earth. You see, in ancient times, the land of Israel was the crossroads of three of the world's great continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It was so significant and so central to those, those continents that even the Gentile nations in the ancient world called the land of Israel the navel of the earth, the center of the earth. 
If you lived in Africa back in Bible times and you wanted to travel by land, either up to Europe or over to Asia, you had to travel right through the land of Israel. Just east of there was desert. People didn't want to go through that desert. You had to go right through the land of Israel. If you were in Europe and you wanted to travel by land down to, to, to Israel, you had, uh, I'm sorry, down to Africa, you had to travel right through the, the land of Israel. If you were in Asia and you wanted to travel by land to Africa, you had to travel right down through the nation of Israel. While the Jews were in that land, they probably had several thousand people from other nations traveling through their nation every day. And therefore, the Gentiles recognized the central location and the, and the significant way to travel from one continent to another. When they're going through the nation of Israel, they could observe if this nation was being blessed more than they were. And they could also observe if this nation is being cursed tremendously and is suffering uh, many disasters and going to arouse the curiosity of the other nations of the world. Why is it this twofold way with this particular nation? And so God purposely placed that nation in that most strategic geographical location upon the face of the earth in ancient times. And it's no mistake that he's replaced that nation back in that same strategic geographical location again, beginning back in 1948. And notice how almost every week, without exception, the whole world's attention keeps being drawn back to that little state of Israel, the Middle East. We had a proportion for its size. Geographically, it's only about the size of our state of New Jersey, and that's it. And the greatest display of God's glory, of impressing the world with who he is, is yet to come in the future. And the prophetic scriptures reveal that, and we're going to deal with some of that later on, if not tonight, then, then tomorrow night, where God wants them there for the end time events. And it's going to make an incredible impact upon the nations of the world, particularly when Jesus Christ comes out of heaven in his glorious second coming and steps down on the nation of Israel on the Mount of Olives, just outside the city of Jerusalem. His glorious second coming to set up God's kingdom rule there upon planet Earth for 1,000 years. So he brought them out of Egypt. He specifically says there in Leviticus 25, verse 38, I brought you out of Egypt to be your God, but also to give you this land. That location was strategic to his plans and purposes for the nation of Israel that he had in mind for them to carry out as his servant here upon planet Earth. Now, the next purpose God had for the nation was to be a channel of God's blessing to all mankind. A channel of God's blessing to all mankind. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, and Genesis chapter 18, verse 18, God said to Abraham, and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Then in Genesis 26, verse 4, he said to Abraham's son Isaac, In you and your seed, all families of the earth will be blessed. Then in Genesis chapter 28, and verse 14, he said to Abraham's grandson Jacob, And in you and your seed, all families of the earth will be blessed. God brought Israel into existence as a channel through which he could bring blessing to all the people here upon planet Earth. Now, he's already done some of that blessing. And we heard about it in our devotions this evening. The Bible, God gave to the world through the nation of Israel. You know, in the book of Romans, in chapter 1, Paul points out how sinful the Gentiles are before God. <laughs> They deserve God's judgment. But then in chapter 2, he points out how sinful the Jews are, just as sinful as the Gentiles that deserve God's judgment. And Paul apparently anticipated, in light of that, that some of his Jewish readers were going to ask him a question. Well, if in God's sight we Jews are just as corrupt and sinful as the Gentiles, what advantage is there of being a Jew, if that's the case? And Paul addresses that in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. 
Well, here's the question. Apparently, some of the Jewish readers threw at him. What advantage, then, has the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Unto the Jews were committed the oracles of God. What's he mean by the oracles of God? God's revealed revelation of truth through apostles and prophets who were recorded infallibly in their original writing. And he gave his word to the world through the nation of Israel. You know, as far as we know, all the books of the Bible, with the possible exception of three, were written by Jews, either Jewish prophets in the Old Testament or Jewish apostles and New Testament prophets in the New Testament. We don't know for certain who wrote the book of Job. The Bible doesn't tell us that. Maybe uh, Job wrote it, or maybe it was a Jewish prophet back at that time. We just don't know. And then the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts were written by Luke. And uh, many scholars traditionally have felt that Luke was a Gentile, although now some New Testament scholars are beginning to question that, beginning to wonder, maybe Luke was a Jew as well. But overwhelmingly, we know for certain, with the possible exception of those three books, that the Word of God that you and I hold in our hands was written through a Jewish prophet and Jewish apostles. Jewish apostles. Uh, and if we could have time tonight for some of you to stand and give testimony of blessing that's come to you through this book, God's Holy Scriptures, that we heard about in our devotions this evening. I'm sure many of you could do that. When I pastored and sometimes would had to go into a home where there was a family crisis. People sometimes will say, Pastor, you'll never know how much encouragement and strength and help we've received from the Word of God, the Scriptures, during this crisis. Or going to a hospital where somebody was either on their deathbed or wasn't a fatal illness, but it was a crisis for them, and say, Pastor, what comfort I've gotten during this crisis, particularly reading through the book of Psalms, of great help to me. God giving the scriptures, his holy word, authoritative word to all mankind, overwhelmingly through the nation of Israel. That's one major blessing God's given to the whole world through that nation, the descendants of Abraham. But then there's a second blessing. The Messiah's Savior came to the world through the nation of Israel. We're here in Romans. Turn over, please, to Romans chapter 9. And we'll look at verses 4 and 5. Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Paul, at the end of verse uh, 3, is talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh. Referring to Israelites, he says, verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises whose are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, the Messiah came, who is over all, God blessed forever. He's saying the Messiah was born into the world through the nation of Israel, through the nation of Israel. Back in eternity past, when within the Godhead, they had to make a decision which one of the persons of the Godhead would come during the course of world history of the planet Earth become incarnated in human flesh, to die as a savior for the sins of the world, it was determined that God's son would be the one who would do that. And because become human, incarnated human flesh, he had to have a human birth. And since there are already nations in existence, they had to choose which nation would the nation through which God's son would receive his humanity by incarnation. And they chose the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel. God's eternal son allowed himself to become a human being through incarnation. He didn't, he didn't give up any of his deity. He maintained that. But in addition to his deity, he now added humanity to himself through a physical birth of a Jewess, 
of a Jewess, Mary, there upon planet Earth. He, in his humanity, became a Jew. He wasn't a Jew before that, because he existed in eternity past with God as a spirit being. He, the only way he could become a Jew is through having birth through a Jewess. And so he became a Jew to be the Messiah here upon planet Earth and to bring blessing through his sacrifice of the cross, but also future blessing when he comes in his second coming as a Jew to, re, to rule the world on behalf of God for the last 1,000 years of our present planet Earth's history. So the Messiah Savior came to the world as a Jew in his humanity. And already there's been great blessing to what he's done for us on the cross of Calvary. And look at all the miracles he performed while he was here and everything as a Jew doing these for the glory of God. And in light of that, the third great blessing God has brought to the world to the nation of Israel is salvation. Salvation. Turn with me, if you would, please, to John chapter 4, verse 22. This is an incredible statement that Jesus made. John chapter 4 at verse 22. He was talking to a Samaritan woman. And as you probably know, the Samaritans and Jews were enemies of each other and kind of hated each other with a passion. And here Jesus is, in his humanity, as a Jew. And he stops at Jacob's well there in the land of Israel. And the Samaritan woman came there for water. And they got into a conversation. And look at what Jesus uh, said to the Samaritan woman, John chapter 4 and verse 22. He said to her, let's begin in verse 21. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know, say we Jews know what we worship. Now notice this statement, for salvation is of the Jews. Here's the Savior saying, salvation is of the Jews. People get saved through placing faith in a Jew, the Lord Jesus. Salvation is of the Jews. That's an incredible statement by the Savior who was going to provide that salvation. Salvation is of the Jews. It comes to the world through the nation of Israel. One of my colleagues on our staff, we have a great mix of Jewish and Gentile believers with the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry. One of my colleagues, Steve Herzig, who's the director of all of our North American missionaries and everything, was ministering at a church down south some time ago. And after the service, there was a big, tall uh, Texan guy that walked up to him and said, Steve, I appreciate you and your ministry, but I have to be honest with you, I don't like Jews. They irritate me. They rub me the wrong way. I just don't like Jews. I appreciate you and your ministry, but I just can't stand Jewish people. And Steve said to him, well, let me ask you a question. What's your question? Have you ever placed your faith in Jesus Christ to be your Savior from sin? Of course I have. I wouldn't be here this morning if I hadn't done that. He said, well, then you've got a major problem. He said, what's my major problem? You've got a Jew living inside of you right now. <laughs> Salvation is of the Jews. Because it was, it was a divine being who in his humanity became a Jew. To die at a cross and die as your substitute and my substitute, substitute for all mankind. Salvation is of the Jews. And Jesus, the Savior, made that incredible statement. Another great blessing God has given to the world. Now, here's another area of blessing. This is totally apart from the, from the Bible, from the Word of God. Do you know that some of the greatest and very numerous medical discoveries have been made historically by Jewish medical researchers? And I'm just going to quickly read to you a list here tonight and this by no means is exhaustive. There are many more that we could give to you. But just sit and listen to this. Here are things that have been discovered and developed by Jewish medical researchers. The method for measuring blood pressure. The cure for beriberi. The concept of vitamins. The vaccine for cholera. 
invention of the ophthalmology instruments for examining the human eye, the invention of the laryngoscope for examining the human larynx, development of polio vaccine, Salk and the other two researchers who developed that polio vaccine, all of them were Jews. And I was old enough to be a youth and even kind of in my teenage years before that was discovered. And I can tell you, at least in my hometown, I remember once when I was maybe about 10 years of age, there was a young woman just around the corner from where we lived who came down with polio. And the whole neighborhood was terrified of that. Back then, you were quarantined. You couldn't leave the house and everything because you might expose this to other people. And some people became so paralyzed they had to live the rest of their lives in these automatic, what they called uh, lung type things where they would lay or flat their back just to be able to breathe, get oxygen to survive. It was a horrendous disease. Many died from it. When that vaccine was discovered that practically eliminated polio, at least from North America whatsoever, with great relief for many parents who were worried about their children being infected by that illness. That was discovered by Jewish medical researchers. Then the discovery of antibiotics by Jewish medical researchers, discovery of the method for determining susceptibility to diphtheria, discovery of the first effective medicine to control and treat tuberculosis, discovery of the test for syphilis, discovery, discovered the method for diagnosing and preventing typhoid fever, discovery of cortisone, and the work that eventually led to the discovery of insulin, and on and on and on the list goes. One of the more recent ones they have discovered and developed is a little camera the size of a pill. And you swallow it, and it goes through your whole digestive system in about two hours. And while it's going down through your digestive system, it's photographing everything that's in your digestive system. And they've got the electronic equipment there to get those photographs so that within two hours they can tell without having to have all these intrusive instruments going into your body, they can tell very easily, you know, what your major problem may be. And more and more discoveries that they're making. They, uh, even, even uh, secular people say they are the cutting edge of medical research in the world today, the, in the nation of Israel, going on for the good of mankind. Just a few samples of God bringing blessing to the whole world uh, through the nation of Israel here in this day and age in which you and I are now living. Now, here's another purpose for which God brought the nation of Israel into existence, and that is to play a future key role in the fulfillment of God's purpose for history. To play a future key role in the fulfillment of God's purpose for history. Now, in order to understand this, we've got to get some background. Back in eternity past, God determined to have a kingdom over which he could rule as a sovereign king. In order to have a kingdom, you must have two things. Number one, you must have a realm that constitutes your kingdom and over which you exercise your rule. The Bible indicates God created the universe to be the realm of his universal kingdom over which he could rule as the sovereign lord of the universe. But you not only have to have a realm, you have to have personal subjects who will serve you within a kingdom, in order to have a kingdom. And the Bible reveals that God decided to create two kinds of personal subjects to serve him in his universal kingdom. First, he created an enormous host of beings that the Bible calls angels. The prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 7, the apostle John in Revelation chapter 5 record the fact that they were privileged to see I taken a visionary form. God sitting upon his throne in heaven, surrounded by an enormous host of holy angelic beings. In fact, in the Greek text of what John wrote in, uh, in Revelation chapter 5, it indicates that the angels existed literally in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions around the throne of God in heaven, maybe several billion that God created to be personal subjects to serve him primarily in the, 
uh, in the uh, heavenly realm of God's universal kingdom. Well, then God created planet Earth. And then he brought into existence through his creative power the second kind of personal subject to serve in his kingdom, and that was man. And as you know, he created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, and placed them in a perfect environment here upon planet Earth. When you read Genesis 1, verses 26 to 28, we're told that when God created man, he gave man dominion over this entire earthly province of God's universal kingdom. The fact that God gave man dominion over planet Earth tells us that the original form of government that God established here upon planet Earth is that which is called a theocracy. The word theocracy literally means God rule. If you look up that term in a good dictionary, you find it defines something like this. A theocracy is a form of government in which God's rule is administered by a representative. You see, God appointed the first man, Adam, to be his representative here upon planet Earth. And as God's representative, it was Adam's responsibility to administer God's rule exactly the way he wanted to be administered on behalf of God over this entire earthly province of God's universal kingdom. Well, now that God completed the realm of his kingdom, the universe, and then he had uh, established a theocracy upon planet Earth and had now human subjects to serve in his kingdom, when we come to the last verse of Genesis 1, we're told that God looked at everything that he had made. And everything that he had made, his evaluation was, it was all very good. But tragically, it didn't remain that way very long. Sometime after God completed the creation of his kingdom, the highest rank, most magnificent of all the angels God created, a great angel that in Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning verse 11, is described as the anointed cherub who covers who was perfect in his ways from the day he was created till iniquity was found in him. This magnificent angel, apparently the most powerful, the most brilliant, most magnificent appearance of the spirit realm of all the angelic beings he created, became consumed with pride over how great he was. And in his pride, he deceived himself into thinking, I'm so great, I can make myself just like God. He saw that God had a universal kingdom over which he ruled as a sovereign king. If he were to be like God, he too would want to be able to rule over that universal kingdom in place of God, in place of God. He wanted to be the ultimate sovereign ruler of the universe that God created. And since God had both angelic and human creatures within his kingdom, if he were to be like God, he too would have to have both angelic and human creatures within his kingdom. But this angel had a problem God did not have, and that's the fact that he was only a creature, not the creator. He didn't have the ability to create other angels and human beings. Only God could do that. So the most he could hope for was to start a revolt against God and to get God's angels and God's human beings to join him in his revolt against God. And by the way, when this angel began this revolt, God changed his name to Satan, which means enemy or adversary because that's what this exalted angel now become, the great enemy or adversary of God. Satan made his approach first to the other angels, and several scriptures reveal he succeeded in persuading a sizable number of God's angels to join him in his revolt against God. One of the ways we know that is Jesus in Matthew 25 referred to the devil and his angels. Revelation chapter 12 refers to the devil and his angels. Now that Satan had some angels for his kingdom, Then he made his approach to man here upon planet Earth. Now, when you look at everything the Bible teaches about angels, it's obvious they have the ability to take upon themselves any shape or form necessary in order to carry out a task. In this instance, Satan took upon himself the deceptive form of a serpent or a snake. How do we know that that serpent there in the Garden of Eden, according to Genesis chapter 3, was Satan? Well, both... Uh, Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation 20 called Satan that serpent of old, that serpent of old. And you know the tragic story. He made his approach to Eve and persuaded her to join him as revolt by, uh, against God by persuading her to eat the forbidden fruit that God had forbidden Adam and Eve to eat. Then he goes after Adam, and Adam made that same faithful choice as well. He ate the forbidden fruit as well. 
And as a result, the fall of man away from God took place. Now, there were some very tragic consequences of that fall of man taking place. Number one, now that God's representative, Adam, had defected from God, the theocracy was now lost as the world government that God had established here when he created Adam. Because, again, a theocracy is a form of government in which God's rule is administered by a representative, and now that Adam, as representative, had defected from God, the theocracy was lost as a form of government here upon planet Earth. The second tragic consequence of that was this. Satan thereby usurped the rule of the world system. And the scriptures reveal that ever since the fall of man, Satan and his forces have been dominating, controlling the world system. And uh, this is why Jesus, uh, for example, when uh, more than once while he was here, called Satan the prince, literally the ruler of this world, the ruler of this world. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. As you know, while Jesus was here, Satan tempted him in, in a number of different ways. If you look at Luke chapter 4, verse 5, we're told, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world at a moment of time. Notice Satan had the ability of visionary form to cause all the kingdoms of the whole world system to pass visually before the Lord Jesus. And then notice verse 6, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give you, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. Literally, the Greek says, It has been handed over to me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. Notice Satan had the authority to turn over the rule of the whole world system to whomever he chose. Well, he says, he told Jesus how he got that. It was handed over to him. Who handed over the rule of the world system to God's enemy, Satan? Adam did. Because Adam, the first man, was the one to whom God initially entrusted that rule of the world system to exercise God's rule on his behalf. Whether Adam recognized it or not, when he made that faithful choice to rebel against God following Satan's lead, he was thereby handing over the rule of the world system to God's enemy, Satan, that God had entrusted to him for his care. This is why then John, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, says that the whole world lies in wickedness. In fact, the Greek could literally be translated, the whole world lies in the wicked one, referring to Satan. He's the one that dominates and controls the world system ever since the fall of man. This is why James, in James chapter 4 and verse 4, uh, indicates to believers, you better not love the world system in which you live, in the sense of selling yourself out to it wholesale. Because whoever does that makes himself the enemy of God. And the reason for that is, it's God's ultimate enemy, Satan, is the one that dominates, controls the world system. By the way, I just point out to you, that's why the world right now is in the grand mess it's in. The grand mess it's in right now. Because Satan, the ultimate enemy of God, and his force at once dominate, controlling the world system in which we live here upon planet Earth. All right. Now, the theocracy was lost. That was one tragic consequence of the fall of man. The other one, Satan usurps the rule of the world system and dominates it ever since, together with his forces, his people. Another tragic consequence was that a curse came upon all of nature here upon planet Earth. Remember when God came down to the Garden of Eden to confront Adam and Eve and Satan in their respective roles in the fall of man? God said to Adam, curse it as a ground for your sake. From now on, it'll be by the sweat of your face that you'll till the soil of the earth to grow food to sustain life. I take it that curse of man's fall radically reduced the fertility level of the soil of the earth from what it was from the time of creation until the fall of man took place. Then God also said to Adam, the earth will also give forth such difficult things as thorns and thistles, which again will make your work of growing food to sustain life more difficult for you. That curse also came upon the animal realm. Uh, if you were to look at the last one or two verses of Genesis chapter 1, before the fall of man took place, God revealed that all animals were vegetarian in diet. 
They were not carnivorous, turned each other's flesh as a source of food. And so, as a result of God's appointed representative defecting from God, that whole realm that God gave him authority over was affected. Now the curse of man, sin, came upon the animal realm, and many animals became wild and teared each other's flesh. This is why Paul in Romans chapter 8 says that all of creation was subjected to vanity, not of its own choosing. Nature didn't ask to be put out of this curse, but it was subjected to it nonetheless. And Paul goes on to say that all of creation groans and travails in pain. It can hardly wait until the ultimate day of redemption when this curse of man's sin will be lifted off of nature and nature restored back to the way it was before the fall of man took place. Every time I'm driving down the highway and I see roadkill, I remind of that curse that came upon the animal realm. They're suffering as a result of that curse of Adam making that faithful choice to join in Satan's revolt against God. Now, what's interesting, if you were to look at Genesis chapter 3, God delivered a promise. He delivered a promise. But it's important to note, he, he spoke this promise not to Adam nor to Eve, but to his enemy, Satan. To his enemy, Satan. And this is what he said to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Between your seed... Now, Satan doesn't have biological seed, but he has spiritual seed. Because unsaved people are called the children of the devil in the word of God. They belong to Satan's spiritual, evil spiritual kingdom rule upon planet Earth. He doesn't have biological seed, but uh, he does have unsaved people. I mean, he doesn't father biological seed, but he has unsaved people or, or his spiritual seed here in the world. And so God's saying, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman between the woman's seed and your seed. Now, notice here, normally the word seed in the Bible re refers to the man. When procreation takes place, the man provides the seed, the woman provides the egg. But notice, he's saying there's going to be a man-child born exclusively of woman, the woman's seed, which implies a virgin birth. The seed of the woman will crush you, bruise your head. God used language that fit the serpent form that Satan took upon himself. This was God's way of saying, Satan, during the course of world history, there's going to be a man-child redeemer born of woman in the world. And he's going to be my instrument of crushing you, Satan, and ridding you and your rule from planet Earth altogether. Now, if a human being brings his or her heel down hard upon the head of a serpent, that'll be a fatal blow for that serpent. This was God's way of saying to Satan, the whole key to my defeating you and crushing you in your revolt is going to be the coming and work of this man-child redeemer born of woman during the course of world history. But then he said to Satan, and you will bruise his heel. If a poisonous serpent sinks its fangs into the bare heel of a human being. If that human being doesn't get help in a hurry, that human being will die. This was God's way of saying, Satan, as a result of your work in the world, that man-child redeemer is going to die. Why would he die? Well, God revealed further through further revelation, years afterward, that man-child redeemer would die as a substitute for the sins of mankind. Sins of mankind. And why? Would that be necessary? Well, in order for God to crush his enemy, Satan, and get rid of him and his rule from the world system, God had to deal effectively with the thing that got mankind into the terrible predicament it got into, and that thing was sin. And so in order for God to accomplish the purpose for history and get, crush Satan, get rid of him and his rule from the world system, and God restore his kingdom rule to the earth, Sometime during the course of world history, he had to deal effectively with man's sin, with man's sin. Now, I point out to you, this is one of the reasons, not the only one, as we'll see, why the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the Son of God in human flesh, was necessary. He's the seed of the woman, born without a human father. Paul, in Galatians 4, 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, 
I believe Paul had in mind Genesis 3.15 when he wrote that. And so Jesus, one reason he became incarnate human flesh was so that at his first coming he could go to the cross and deal effectively with the cause of the predicament man got himself into, human sin. But another reason why his incarnation of human flesh was absolutely essential was so that at his second coming, he could crush Satan and get rid of him and his rule from the world system. And then as the last Adam, Paul calls him the last Adam in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, restore God's theocracy back to planet Earth, where now God again will have a man, the incarnated Jesus Christ, as his representative administering God's rule over planet Earth for the last 1,000 years of our present planet Earth's history. You see, according to the Bible, in order, what happened when Satan got angels and mankind to rebel against God, that began a spiritual war within the universe between Satan's kingdom and God's kingdom. And you can trace that spiritual warfare throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the life of Christ, through church history. You can see it going around us in, in the world today. And the scriptures reveal is going to continue up until the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And in light of this, Satan's goal, world history, through this warfare against God and God's universal kingdom, is to overthrow God as the sovereign ruler of the universe and replace God with himself as the sovereign ruler of the universe. By contrast, God's purpose for history, and therefore the ultimate purpose, is for God to glorify himself by demonstrating the fact that he alone is the sovereign God of the universe. And that no creature, no matter how powerful or intelligent, no matter how much time given to try every means conceivable throughout history to overthrow God, he cannot do it. And so the Bible reveals, in order for God to fulfill that purpose for history, there are certain things he must do before the history of our present planet Earth comes to an end. Number one, he must crush his enemy Satan and get rid of him and his rule from the world system all, for, all forever. And secondly, when he does that, God must restore his theocracy to this planet. For once again, he'll have a man, an Adam, administering his rule for the last 1,000 years of world history. If that doesn't take place, then God ends up defeated by his enemy Satan within the scope of our present planet Earth's history. That's why the future millennial thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ upon the earth is absolutely essential. Because God began this earth with that theocracy as original form of government. But then it was lost as a result of Satan's work against God. If God doesn't restore that theocracy before the history of this private earth comes to an end, then he ends up defeated by his enemy Satan within the scope of our present planet Earth's history. Again, that's why that future millennium must take place for the honor and glory of God. All right? What does Israel have to do with this? Because we indicate here one of its purposes for Israel to play a key role in the accomplishment of God's plan and purpose for history. Israel's role is this. As we noted in our first session, at Mount Sinai, God said to Israel, one of the reasons I brought you into existence is for you to be a kingdom of priests, the spiritual leader of the whole world. Well, Israel itself rebelled against God over and over and over again. You know that from the Old Testament and even since Old Testament times went off into apostasy away from God. God will not crush Satan and rid his rule from planet Earth and restore his theocracy to planet Earth through the Messiah until the nation of Israel repents of its rebellion against God and accepts Jesus Christ as its Messiah and Savior. The scriptures make that very clear. It's not the Gentiles that have to do that before Satan is crushed and God's kingdom restored. It's not the Samaritans have to do that. It's exclusively the nation of Israel that must repent of their rebellion against God, except Jesus as their Messiah and Savior, before God will crush Satan and restore God's theocracy to planet Earth. Why is it? It's Israel has to do that, because God has ordained, and the prophetic scriptures reveal that, God has ordained that during the thousand-year reign of the Messiah, Israel will be the spiritual leader of the whole world. The church saints, according to the Bible, will be politicians in Christ's government during the thousand-year reign of Christ. But Israel is to be the spiritual leader of the whole world during the thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus. And uh, just let me quickly 
point out some scriptures that indicate this. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Actually, we, we've given this to you in the notes. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. God reveals that during Messiah's reign upon the earth, he will dwell in the most magnificent temple the people of Israel have ever had there at Jerusalem. And he indicates that during that time, all the people of the world, all the nations of the world are going to come to Israel's capital city to pray, to worship, to hear the word of God instructed to them by Jesus Christ, and to be instructed on how God's rule is to be administered over them worldwide. What God's revealing there is that during the thousand reign of Christ, Israel's capital city will be both the governmental and spiritual center of the whole world. And the people all over the world are going to come there to pray, to worship, to be instructed in God's word by Jesus and instructed how God's rule is to be administered over them. Then in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 6, Isaiah 61, verse 6, God speaking ahead of time to Jews who will be living there in Israel during the future millennium, he says to them, you will be called the priests of the Lord and the ministers of our God. God says, you Jews, during the future millennium, the Gentiles will call you the priests of the Lord and the ministers of our God. Then in Zechariah chapter 8, verses 20 through 23, God foretells that during that future reign of the Messiah, people from all over the world will say to each other, let's go to Jerusalem to pray, to worship. And God says when they do that, Ten Gentiles will lay hold of one Jew and say, you take us with you to Jerusalem to worship because we see that God is with you. God is determined that Israel will finally fulfill the way it was supposed to, to be the spiritual leader of the whole world. And he won't crush Satan and get rid of him and Israel from the world system and restore his theocracy until the nation that's to be the spiritual leader of the whole world for a thousand years is itself spiritually right with God. You can't have a spiritual leader without a joint with God, leading other people in a right relationship with the true and the living God. And so God, that's one of his purposes for that nation, to play a key role in the fulfillment of God's plan and purpose for history that he'll bring about in conjunction with the second coming of Christ when finally the nation of Israel will repent. And uh, perhaps in some of our other sessions, like tomorrow night and Friday night, we'll even look at some scriptures where God's going to have to put Israel to the most horrible time of suffering that's ever experienced in all of world history to break their stubborn rebellion during the future tribulation period to where they will cry out for their true Messiah. And that's when Jesus will come out of heaven in his glorious second coming. God our Father, we worship you together with your Son, Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit is the only true and the living God. We thank you that you're the sovereign, omnipotent God of the universe. You have a plan and purpose for world history and for mankind, and therefore us as individual human beings. We thank you that you've not allowed us to remain in ignorance or darkness concerning that plan and purpose. You've mapped it out for us in your inspired scriptures. Lord, please take these significant truths of your word and why you've raised up the nation of Israel, not because they were better than other people, but because you have unique purposes for that nation as you're progressively working out your plan and purpose for the whole world and for mankind. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son in his first coming to become incarnated in human flesh, to die as our substitute of the cross. But we thank you that that's not the end of his ministry on behalf of this planet Earth and mankind. He's going to return again in his glorious second coming after the tribulation period. Rid the earth of Satan's rule from planet Earth, and then restore your theocratic government rule to this planet, where he will serve as the last Adam, your representative, to administer your rule the way you intended to be administered before the fall of man took place in the Garden of Eden. Thank you, Lord, for this hope that you give to us. And for all this, we praise you and we thank you and we worship you. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus, the promised Messiah, amen.